Good morning, everybody. My name is Ashwarya Shetty, and it's a privilege to be here. Um, today, I'm going to teach you the alphabet, right? A is for apple, B is for ball, C is for cat, and D is for doll. And we've all learned this. But there are so many students in the world who have no clue what the alphabets are. There are 1.4 billion children who learn it in school, but there are also 263 million children who are out of school. What that means is one in every five children globally do not have access to education, even in its simplest form. And this is a really worrying thing because this number is increasing by 30% every single year. Additionally, for the 130 million children who are in school who have completed four years of schooling, still do not know how to read or do basic addition. And everyone says it's a problem that is impossible to solve. And they're right, because if we use the same traditional conventional approach to schools, these children will always be the hardest to reach. The reality is that any system that is failing one in five of its beneficiaries needs to be seriously reconsidered. And then COVID-19 happened and it gave us the golden opportunity because in April 2020, our conventional education system came to a grinding halt and every single school in the world closed and every single child was out of school. So education had to evolve instantly and we had to get creative and we all moved to different models of online learning. And let's see how that worked, right? When you think of online learning or when you think of distance learning, the first things that come to our minds is internet, computer, um, teacher facilitation that's being done remotely, emails, Google classrooms, and all of that. Now I want you to picture this. I want you to remove the superpower of distance learning, that is the internet. So imagine you have no access to online schools, no Zoom calls with teachers, no video games, or no emails. Now imagine that I took away your resources too, no textbooks, no any kind of books really, no educational toys or no stationery. Now imagine that I tell you that your parent at home is semi-literate and has to focus on earning a daily living in the middle of a pandemic and cannot be at home to help you learn. Finally, imagine that there is no technology of any sort available, no iPads, computers, smartphones, TVs, or even radios. This, my friends, is the reality of distance education for more than 50% of households in developing countries. And this is a significant number of children who are unreached. There's no technology, no resource availability, and no support from parents who, can, who cannot possibly be their teachers because they are struggling with literacy rates themselves. So it should not come as a surprise that 465 million children, that is one in four, were not reached with any kind of learning through the course of the pandemic. Imagine how scary that is for two years, no kind of education whatsoever. But then this is where we play in. We're the innovation team at Education Above All. It's based out of Doha, but works globally. Excuse me, I'm letting the airplane fly. We focus on helping the world's most marginalized communities and learners achieve quality access to education. And our role as the innovation team is to focus on the hardest to solve problems, design, develop, and pilot new solutions. And I'm happy to report that over the last two years, we have reached almost a million children in this particular context, working directly with some of the most deprived contexts in Sudan, Yemen, India, Pakistan, Morocco, Afghanistan, 
and hundreds of other places in urban slums with refugees, with tribal children, and with the most remote rural communities. We worked in places where schools are closed or do not even exist, where students have never owned a book, where there are no educated teachers, where the maximum technology available is a simple feature phone with one person in their entire community, which is often shared. We were committed to finding ways to engage these particular learners in, in, and give them meaningful learning experiences. And we did, did this using our award-winning internet-free education resource bank, also called iFirm. It is a learning approach that consists of multiple resources that promote holistic and experiential learning inspired from the child's own surroundings. It includes different resources with the essence being project-based learning, game-based and activity-based modules and also related facilitator and evaluation tools. All of this to help two to 14 year old children who have low resources, no technology and need a way to learn when schools are disrupted. Each of these education resources span about over a week incorporating different subjects and disciplines together. Now, this is what we have learned from um, implementing this in different countries. And we realized that the world currently needs five fundamental shifts in education. I'll tell you more about IFOB as and when we go. You can go to this website. All of our resources are cost-free. You can download it and use it. So number one is that we need to move from teacher-led classrooms to community-based education. We rightfully eulogize our Sorry formal education. Sorry, Sorry? To interrupt you. Sorry to interrupt you. Are you switching between slides? I cannot, uh, did you? Yeah, sorry. Because um, I'm not able to see that. I'm sorry to interrupt oh. you. Oh, that's no problem. Right, right. You're sharing your screen now. Please go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. No issues. Yeah. So um, you can refer to this link uh, if you want to have a look at all of the internet free, cost free, technology free education resources developed by the innovation team in education above all. Um, so the first shift that you know, we realized that we need to make in education is to move from teacher led classrooms to community based education. We rightfully eulogize our formal education teachers so much that we often forget our very first teachers, our family. Even in homes with like low literacy, rate, low literacy rates, families are often like completely excluded from the learning journey and resulting in a growing chasm of learning proficiency. We had, when we had minimal access to qualified teachers in these rural communities, when we had minimal access to resources, we decided to capitalize on the powerful life lessons and innate knowledge of communities. In Kenya, grandmothers told their grandchildren traditional folk tales to practice literacy skills in the absence of any books. So learners listened to these folk tales, reimagined them, modernized them, and authored some beautiful storybooks to capture their culture and heritage. A lot of these books found a home in the small community libraries that the children built themselves. Imagine this a library in a community or a village that never previously had a book. These interactions not only helped learners acquire practical knowledge, but also deepened familial bonds. And in a, in a very moving story uh, from a very conservative district in Pakistan, a mother you know, had only been previously discussing cooking and groceries and other mundane things um, with a 12-year-old girl called Laiba. And as Laiba was doing these project-based learning modules, um, she, she started discovering that her daughter, you know, is actually very smart. So there was a project called the Family Tree Project where children have to 
interview members of their family, do a kind of census, um, figure out where their roots are. It integrates numeracy, literacy, social studies, all of it. And because she was interacting with her family and presenting her learnings to them, um, the mother realized that, you know, she's been asking her a lot of questions. She began to tell where the family came from using uh, a geographical map to show migration. She explained genetics and Venn diagrams to her mother as part of the project when exploring communities, similarities and differences. And finally, she used statistical rep representations to show her mother how she calculated the average age or percentage of males and females in that entire family line. Her mother was so inspired by the daughter's intelligence and abilities that she took a bold move to cancel the impending um, child marriage and re-enroll her back to school. This is the power of involving communities in education. They have a massive stake at a child's learning journey. When we depend on formal schooling systems too much to a point where if it's disrupted, children have no access to any form, we need to figure out a way to enroll communities and families in the child's learning. So that was shift number one. Shift number two is to move from classrooms to the streets. Learning has become like a job, you know, from 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. You're confined in the four walls of the classroom. But with closed buildings, we helped free learning to happen anywhere, everywhere and all the time. Learners set up their own stores on the side of the road in India uh, to attract more customers as part of the project, set up your own store. They made posters to advertise their products. They sold everything, including agricultural products. They grew and they also made invoices to practice numeracy skills. The real learning though in this project was the art of negotiation, which is something we probably wouldn't find in our textbooks. Just imagine how much learning happens when in the mud streets of Zambia, children draw a number line and jump to play maths. That's a part of our jumping math project. I promise you it took much less than four years of school to teach them basic addition. So this is like the jumping math project where children, you know, learned math through game-based activities. They created different versions of these games as part of the project and therefore learned numeracy along the way. Uh, just a disclaimer, all these images, you know, are not clear because as I said, the kind of context we're working in, there is no access to fancy smartphones and that's why you'll see blurry images. I hope that's okay. The third shift from the third lesson really from our implementation of uh, project-based learning in these rural communities was we need to go from globally standardized content to locally relevant and contextual learning. Educators designing you know, curriculum in ministries are often in cities that are far away from the rural context. And it's very hard for them to imagine the lives of many of these children. For us, some tough lessons were that students had never seen a newspaper. They didn't know, you know, what an animated comic character was. And how did, how do we expect them to just assume to have all of these prerequisite skills? Also, sometimes learning becomes irrelevant for them. What we learn at a global standard it may not be relevant for a child in a particular village or a community. Of course. In an eye-opening example, learners in a remote and tribal district in Sudan told us that they have never seen an apple. So when I say A is for apple, how do they relate to that? A is not for apple for them. But what they do associate with the letter sound A is arrow or axe, because they use that very commonly in their tribe. And it's also, that's what they use to harvest the staple food in their forest produce. So we had these tribal children design their own alphabet book as a part of the project ABC by Me, where children are given the freedom 
to associate any object from their surroundings. This is an example of the Ch Tribal Child's book where they've written A is for arrow, A is for axe. You know, similarly, um, in, in Afghanistan, uh, when, the, when the whole political crisis happened, we were working with uh, some of the evacuees and refugees who were moving to other countries. And when they were doing this, this project, um, I was really surprised to see that, you know, they use G is for gun, you know? I mean, these communities, they do not expect like G to be goat because they've seen more guns than they've ever seen goats. So learning has to be relevant for the child. It has to be drawn from their surroundings. Um, you know, in flood prone Bihar, Students learned about density by making their own personal flotation devices or life jackets using scrap materials from their house. And this was a part of the project called flood management. A simple project called making your own ID cards can, can be customized so much based on where it is used. For example, um, a nine-year-old Afghan boy, Arif, for him, this ID card was a way to hold on to his identity and his past and also learn about new people around him in the refugee camp in, in the US. In rural Maharashtra, as you can see, it was the first time someone had ever asked these children about them. It helped create a personal identity that is separate from the collective village identity. So this is a part of the Make Your Own ID Cards project, where they also make ID cards for each family member, community members, and so on. And in the process, learn literacy, learn a lot of science, and learn social studies. The fourth shift. The fourth shift is let us stop asking students to stay silent and raise their hands, and instead ask them to use their hands. Before I dwell into this, um, just give me two minutes, please. I think I need to connect my charger so that the rest of the talk is uninterrupted. Please excuse me. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. So, as I said, you know, especially when, I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, this was told to me every time, raise your hands, keep your one hand in your mouth, the other hand up. And um, it is very sad because I think what happens then is we create a culture of um, followers and like following and we kind of reward children who fit within a certain box and we do not really help them reach the true potential that they can use to solve so many problems in their context in their communities and their villages let me give you an example for almost every single intervention it took us almost four weeks for us to convince learners that there was no formula or example or format for them to copy um, somebody else's work. So project-based learning, this is how it works, right? You, you start with like the first day, you understand um, the problem and then you design solutions or you design the final product. And the beauty of project-based learning is it's different for every child. There is no set format or rule and you cannot really copy somebody else's work. We have conditioned our children to, you know, to, to realize that if they do think it should be in a well-defined format or a set box. But once unbridled, it's really like magic and children are unstoppable. In our project um, about COVID-19 in the early days, uh, that in times of limited awareness and vast misinformation, students from Kashmir, and students in Kenya practiced simple sanitation and hand washing. And those, the children even experimented with germ spread, designed games to ed educate their community about how germs spread, and also made their own rules to 
keep COVID-19 away. It's a part of the keep COVID away project. So th these are children in Kashmir. Um, they do not have like water taps. So they were washing their hands in the local stream and they were kind of ha doing a campaign. These are 12, 13 year old children to encourage other people to do the same. This is a Kenyan student who is creating her house rules for COVID that these are the rules that the family is going to follow. And the two outcomes of the same project are very different. Here, the child is creating rules. There, the child, children are demonstrating and encouraging children to practice. So there is nothing that you can copy. You know, it's, it's, you are demonstrating your own learning in your own way. And we have seen such beautiful stories from the ground in all of these different countries and contexts about how, you know, untapped potential was being discovered and being utilized for greater good. Finally, number five, from textbook prescribed facts to discovery and inquiry-based learning. We often, you know, didn't, we often didn't have teachers um, or textbooks to, to share a right answer in these communities that we're working with. As I said earlier, there were no textbooks, there were no books. So how do children know whether an answer is right or wrong? So that's why we had to rely heavily on discovery and inquiry-based learning. So we let students conduct their own hypothesis, run experiments, analyze information, and come to their own conclusions, whether it's something is right or wrong. And one startling uh, project was really a project called Population Census. Um, and this project was run in Lebanon by these children for five days, where learners developed surveys to collect information about their community, family members, and present it as bar graphs and all of that. So they're learning literacy, numeracy, interviewing skills, um, and the whole thing, right? So they ran a series of statistical and graphical experiments that led to the learners deducing that unemployed women or women at home worked much harder than the formerly employed men and were more ambitious. This is the analysis that children made from the population census project. And remember, these are 13, 14 year olds. These lessons are the kind of lessons that we that can only be learned when it is experienced. This is another project called My Pop-Up Restaurant, where children um, are supposed to um, understand science by learning about ingredients. And they're supposed to interact with their parents to figure out like how food is cooked and participate in that and create a whole business plan um, to start their own restaurant, right? And this business plan includes a logistics plan, a marketing plan, and all of those various elements. So this is a pop-up restaurant started by uh, some of the kids in, in India, in Andhra Pradesh. And of course, as you can see, they do not have a lot of resources. And, but I think what is very surprising about this project um, and the byproduct that we really didn't uh, design for was that a lot of the parents reported that this was the first time boys were entering the kitchen and helping their mothers cook. And they realized that they realized the kind of stereotypes that happen, stereotyping that happens with their siblings who are girls and with them. And this project in a way helped break those barriers and helped the boys become active parts of household chores. And they also developed a newfound respect for their mothers because they finally realized that how much of an effort it takes to put out food on the table. So if I can leave you with one thought today, it is a sense of possibility where there is genuine desire, there will be a means to move forward. The reality is that COVID has exposed deep-rooted inequity and has been a huge setback but it has also unshackled us from the constraints of curriculum, classrooms, and assessments. Where there was no technology in schools, we reached our learners in makeshift outdoor learning spaces, using group phone calls, using loudspeakers in the community. Instructions were also written in the village walls in Zambia. 
And we had over an 80% completion rate of the program for 100,000 learners. Where there are no materials, we make our own. Students made their own scientific tools. They made their own rulers. They made their own dice and even made their own books. If there are no teachers, we lead our learning and rely on older siblings, on community members, on family members, and our own powers of deduction and experimentation to keep learning happen. And doing so, we make miraculous leaps in learning. And I'm happy to report that there was 20% learning progress in Mr. all of these communities. To interrupt you in this, uh, we are running yeah. out of time and we have a couple yeah. of questions lined up for uh, sure. you. So can I put them across? Yeah, so I just want to conclude by saying mm -hmm. that um, in over like three months, there was 20% learning progress and all of this was aligned with curricular standards. So learning can be engaging in a way that students are productively lining up outside facilitators' homes and begging their parents to continue their learning, right? Um, so I think I, this just proves to us that we're out of excuses. Um, we can and need to create inclusive innovation and meaningful learning experiences for all 1.6 billion children, whatever their context may be. Uh, I'm looking forward to the questions and please, please do share. Sure, I'll go one by one quickly. So the first question goes like this, it's related to the foundation. What personally motivated you to join Education Above All Foundation? Okay, um, that's an interesting question. So I'm a computer science engineer by degree. Um, but during college, I used to work a lot in the slums uh, near, that were around my college area. And I think, you know, I, I grew up in Qatar and then I went to India for my studies. And it was very, it was a very humbling experience because um, the, the contrast kind of baffled me where I was sitting in an air conditioned classroom with the best infrastructure available to me. And in the slums, children did not have access to basic light. And I think while solving those problems and interacting with those communities over a year, it, it really pushed me to figure out what is going wrong in our education systems. And also, you know, being in the best colleges, I realized that there was a disconnect between what was being taught to me and what I was able to apply to the real world. So I realized that education was the only tool that can really solve any long-term problem you pick. Climate change, gender equity, wars, Right, long-term education, quality education is what has the potential to solve it. So um, I joined the Teach for India Fellowship. I worked in curriculum design for over two, three years after that. Um, and then I think after gaining a very strong context about the education scenario in India, I really wanted to expand my perspective and see what is it like? What are the challenges in education on a global landscape? And education above all works in a global landscape and the innovation scheme specifically works in addressing those challenges. And that's why um, after my stint in India, which was very education based, different domains, ed tech, curriculum design, as a teacher in a school in Islam. So I, I moved to education above all to kind of understand, um, you know, what what are some things, uh, what are some learnings we can use from other countries and share with the other countries? And what are some uh, challenges and perspectives that I may have not experienced in India? And I think it just, it just stays true to the vision of like one day, every child everywhere will attain an excellent education. And that's why I joined the organization. Great to know, Mishati. So the question uh, here goes like this. How do you reach out to the children who need these resources? Oh, um, you, do you mean in terms of, okay, I'm going to answer both. So how we reach out uh, to these children is we develop local partnerships with local NGOs and we empower the NGOs to work in their domain areas. And how we do that is through financial support, through um, training tools and support. So we train them on project-based learning and then the local NGOs reach out. And even after the schools reopened, all these NGOs still started doing project-based learning in their communities after school hours, because even when schools started again, they realized that the quality of education can be you know, greatly enhanced through PBL. Um, so we basically operate in that model where we work, we partner with local organizations and they implement it in their communities and contexts. 
However, now we're kind of, you know, there's so much interest generated in the Internet Free Education Resource Bank that, you know, our bandwidth and capacity is not able to keep up. So we are going to be releasing an entire toolkit for anybody who wants to implement this so that they can just go to the site, get an entire download of how to do this and implement this in the community and so that they can do it in the, like independently, right? And they can ensure that they're reaching the most marginalized learners. Um, but you can go to the website and all of our resources are free. You can just download it and use it. There's no, there's no um, subscription or payment or anything of that sort. All of these resources are open and cost-free. Um, and most importantly, the hardest to reach learners, obviously they do not know English. So um, the local NGOs like translate a lot of the resources. So we have these available in nine languages, a lot of Indian languages really, um, in Assamese and Punjabi and Tamil, um, and you know also in Swahili and everything Arabic. So they they kind you you are allowed to take it, contextualize it, and translate it in a way that is relevant for your community. Uh, obviously, there's some attribution requirements that once you translate it, send it back to us so that we can host it on our platform so that more children can use it in that language. Uh, so it's not just project based learning. We also have games, math games uh, where children play tons of games to also learn math. We have an activity bank for children with disabilities that they can do at home. Again, technology free. We have learning packages and like tons of stuff. And you can just go to the link and check it out. Great to know. So the question related to uh, the next question is related to that only. I have uh, you have you have covered it about the disabilities and all that. Uh, I'll move on to the next question. What difficulties do you face in implementing these initiatives? I think um, the, the I think the, one of the biggest um, resistance points was uh, for parents and teachers to realize that learning can happen without uh, textbooks. So from parents, they, they thought that, you know, children are just having fun and then coming back. Are they really learning anything? Where is their written work? So it took a lot of time, like I think two or three weeks for parents to really understand that learning was happening. You know, that they did not really need to write pages and pages of content to learn. So I think the, the mindset shift from like a textbook based um, learning format to a project-based learning format was difficult. And from teachers, I, I think all of these teachers in rural contexts, they, they, I remember a teacher coming up to us and saying like, the children are just having fun. Like, you know, are they really learning? And we said children are supposed to have fun while learning, you know? Uh, so again, just that, you know, that fear that, okay, are the, is the syllabus being complete and the curriculum concepts being covered? But over time, I think after three or four weeks of doing continuous, consistent project-based learning in the way it's supposed to be done, um, teachers and parents like re immediately realized that this works. You know, children are learning basic concepts, and the we have baseline and endline data uh, tests which prove that, which validated that learning happened through projects, through exploring with the world, to exploring with your team. So I think that was a resistance point, and. All the other challenges of no technology, no resources, I think they were challenging, but our, our, our um, content bank, IFERB, was designed for those to address those challenges. But I think the main thing would be to make that shift from um, book-based learning to project-based learning and realize that project-based learning is, um, is as effective, if not more, than traditional forms of learning. And I think the second point is a lot of teachers think that um, if they do some basic activities with kids, it's project-based. So I think there's a huge difference between giving students projects and project-based learning. Projects is like fun activities that you give your children to do. For example, um, hey, collect some leaves from your area and draw it in your notebook. That's a, that's a project or an activity. Project-based learning is when the child goes, identifies different leaves, understands its history and background, comes up with their own hypothesis, if they could create their ideal leaf, what would it look like? What properties will it have? Um, you know, compare and contrast these different kinds of leaves. Um, so it, it's, it's more deeper. Children actually walk away from that project with the learning they have created for themselves. 
So I think that is another technical difficulty that we had, you know, because some teachers were like, yeah, but we do projects, uh, project-based learning, but ideally it was projects or activities that they did was different from project-based learning. So I think these were the two big uh, challenges, but eventually, you know, it was overcome. Right. So I have a couple of other questions related to uh, the same. Uh, you have covered pretty much everything. One last question, uh, since because of the time constraint, I have to end the meeting quickly. Is um, where do you get the funding from? So Education Above All is an organization that was set up by Her Highness Sheikh Hamoza in Qatar. And Education Above All is an umbrella of seven different organizations. So we are the Innovations Directorate in Education Above All, and we have our own sources of funding in Qatar because it was set up by Her Highness. Um, and that funding, because Qatar has been really invested in education, not in not just in Qatar, but also at a global scale. So there's a lot of um, support that comes from uh, entities and organizations who uh, are based out of Qatar, who fund education above all. and. This funding is used to support other NGOs globally. We're present in over 70 countries um, to ensure that education reaches the hardest, most vulnerable learners. And uh, there are different kinds of programs really. So we have programs for peace education for the internally displaced and refugees. Uh, we have education, Educate a Child, which um, is a program, a global program that ensures that children are enrolled back to schools um, we have, you know, a program for advocating for legal rights and policies. So it, it's really um, the funding that we get is through entities and organizations in the country. And um, it, how, you, you know, we partner with different local organizations, that's a whole process in itself. Um, and the innovations team, we only like work on pilots because the idea of the innovations team is you design, you identify a problem you design a solution and see if the solution works through pilot programs. So now all of these countries and all of these NGOs who have been a part of the pilot programs are sustaining the solution and expanding it in their own way. Even after we, uh, even after the pilot program, the funded pilot program got over, they're still using the solution. So it's sustained. Uh, so that's how we kind of work. So we wish uh, the best for education above all foundation. And we wish like the needy, uh, the students, uh, you can, uh, you know, who can utilize your services and you, we wish that you should reach out to more, many more and spread out in different countries, uh, Mishetti. And we have now completed the round of questions. On behalf of School Journal of Education and schoolreformer.com, we like to thank you for the talk and for patiently answering all the questions, ma'am. i like to thank also you. thank the participants in the meeting and we'll be closing the meeting now. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was lovely.